Hello YouTube, this is CN Maritime History back again with another video, and today I'm talking about the SS Orendor Star. So anyway, let's begin the video. In 1925, the Blue Star Line ordered a set of liners for its London, Rio de Janeiro, Buenos Aires route. Camel, the company Camel Laird of Birkenhead built three sister ships, the Almeida, the Andalusia, and the SS Orendora. John Brown and Company of Clydebank, which would be famous for building Cunard ships, uh, you know, at that time period as well, built, uh, such as, I do believe, they built the Mauritania and the Queen Mary. Actually, both Mauritanias and the Queen Mary. Built two ships for the Blue Star Line as well. These were the Avalona and the Avila. Together, they were called the Luxury Five. Camel Dared launched the SS Orendora on January 4, 1927. She was later completed in May of that year. The Orendora was built as an ocean liner and refrigerated Refrigerated cargo ship, more of a refrigerated cargo ship than an ocean liner. Anyway, when originally built, she measured 12,847 gross registered tons, or GRT. She was 512.2 feet long, had a beam of 68.3 feet, and accommodated 164 first-class passengers. She had a service suite of 16 knots. She had seven, uh, and had seven decks. She was propelled by four steam turbines and two power shafts, which basically means that two steam turbines for every one propeller shaft. In 1929, she underwent a major refit which reduced her cargo space and increased passenger accommodation to turn her into a cruise ship, which means, of course, she was no longer an ocean liner. However, could still do the duties of an ocean liner, but she was built like an ocean liner, but that was a cruise ship. As the SSR Endora, she sailed from London to the east coast of South America from 1927 to 1928. In 1929, she was sent to Fairfield Shipping and Engineering Company, Limited of Glasgow, for refitting. In her refit, her gross tonnage was increased to 14,694, and first class accommodation was increased to 354 passengers. A tennis court was also placed just after the funnels on the boat deck. So, you see the funnels in this picture. Uh, it would be right where the two uh, ventilators are. You can see one of them, and then there's a smaller one behind it. Uh, that would be where the tennis court is, right in the middle there. And a swimming pool was installed in the aft well deck. If you look at a model of Titanic, she has an aft well deck. That would be the small area between the poop deck, and which has something to do with poop. No, I'm not certain. Um, it doesn't at all. I don't know why it's called that. I think it's based off the French word la poop, which means the aftmost part of the ship, if I'm not mistaken, so like the stern, that, that's why it's called that. And then the aft well deck would be right between there and the rest of the superstructure. Upon completion of the refit, she returned to service as a full-time luxury cruise ship. Around the same time, she was renamed the Orendor Star instead of simply the SS Orendor. As a cruise ship, she was based mainly out of, uh, no, sorry, not out of, in Southampton. Her paint scheme of a white hall with a scarlet ribbon, which I will switch over to the other picture because this is not the right one. This is the one with the Scarlet Ribbon. Uh, gave rise to her nicknames of the Scarlet Ribbon or the Chocolate Box. World War II. When the Second World War broke out in September of 1939, Orendora Star was honored from Cherbourg to New York. She returned to Britain via Halifax when she joined convoy HX-1. She made several trips between ports until June 30, 1940, when she set sail on her final voyage. The Arndor Star was transporting Italian internees to internee camps on her final voyage. She sailed unescorted in about 75 miles west of the bloody Forland, Forland Ireland, which I'm not sure where that is, I'll look it up. Uh, U-47, commanded by Gunther Prien, struck Arndor Star with a single torpedo. Gunther Prien, the captain, believed the torpedo to be faulty, but it, but it, de but it detonated on her uh, starboard side, flooding her aft engine room. All engine room personnel, including two engineer officers, were killed. Her turbines, main generators, and emergency generators were all immediately put out of action and therefore knocked out all lights and communications aboard. This would mean there would be total blackout. Nothing. However, they were, I'll talk about this later on, but they were able to, uh, get a distress signal out uh, a little before that, because um, that was when they still had radio power. However, power immediately after the torpedo was gone. Here's what I was talking about. Frederick Brown, uh, 
who was chief officer then, gave the ship's position to the radio officer, who transmitted a distress signal. At 7 uh, 7.05 hours, Milan Head Radio acknowledged the message and retransmitted it to Land's End at Fort Patrick. The cruise ship carried 14 lifeboats and 90 life rafts. The torpedo destroyed one starboard lifeboat and disabled the davits and falls of another. Two lifeboats were damaged during their launch and thus considered useless. The crew that successfully launched the remaining 10 lifeboats and more than half the life rafts. Some lifeboats were overloaded by prisoners descending the falls and side ladders. Many Italians were also afraid to leave the ship. One lifeboat was swamped and sank shortly after it was launched. At least four of the remaining lifeboats were launched with a very small number of survivors. One of the internees who was lost, which I mean killed, was Captain Otto Burfiend, who had been interned after scuttling his ship, the Adolf Please forgive me if I pronounce this wrong. Adolf Woermann. He helped organize the evacuation until the ship sank, during which time he was lost. The ship was diverted to starboard at this point in time. At 7.15, Captain Moulton and his senior officers walked over the side into the rising water. We, it, it, did, it did not tell me where, they just walked over the side, leaving behind many Italians who were still afraid to leave the ship. At 7.20, five minutes after this, the ship rolled over, raised her bow in the air, and sank. 805 people were killed, including Captain Moulton, 12 of his officers, 42 of his crew, and 37 of the military guards. Sergeant Norman Price said of the sinking, I could see hundreds of men clinging to the ship. They were like ants, and then the ship went up at one end and slid rapidly down, taking the men with her. Many men had broken their necks jumping or diving into the water. Others injured themselves by landing on drifting wreckage and floating debris near the sinking vessel. Two hours later, at 9.30, a Sunderland flying boat, speaking of which, I will uh, later on, probably make a video about the Sunderland flying boat because it is involved in more than one World War II sinking ship story. Uh, and I'm going to make a video about the story of Lifeboat 12. Uh, but that's a story for another day. I'll tell you about I'll tell you guys about that then, probably in the comment section or the community page. Awesome. That's okay. Um, okay. So the Sunderland Flying Boat drops supplies for the survivors, such as like medical, medical supplies, uh, food, all in waterproof bags, which is awesome. Um, okay. The plane circled until 1300, when the uh, right around one o'clock, so one o'clock, when the HMCS Saint Laurent arrived and rescued 868 survivors. 586 of these survivors were detainees, the Italians or Germans who had, who were going to Canada to be put in the labor camps. The injured were taken to Glasgow to receive medical treatment. If you were a person who, re if you are a person who, reach who researches athletic history, one of the survivors was the later famous athletics coach Franz Stamfel. I hope I didn't butcher his name. The disastrous impact was overshadowed by the Royal Navy attack on Mers El Kabir, French Algeria. Over the next few months, bodies washed up on the shores of Ireland. 213 were found in August 1940 alone. So. That, that was my uh, retelling of the uh, SSR and your stars story. So I'll explain to you what this picture is. This is a um, a, uh, a map out. A map out. Yeah, I think that's the right the word. Um, of the Arndor stars deck features and surrounding decks. As you can see, it does not show all seven because it counts, of course, the upper deck fixtures and all that stuff. But, um, yeah. And then this is, of course, is a commemorative um, painting of the, uh, like it's a memorial. I forget where I saw, but they have like a, a chapel uh, somewhere that has a, like a, a bronze plaque dedicated to Arndor Star uh, Italian Nijerni victims. Uh, so here's the troop ship picture. This is uh, an advertisement for the Arndor Star uh, right after her refit. As you can see, there's a small tugboat that looks like it's about the cap size, just off her uh, starboard bow. Um, and then, this of course is, it looks a little bit more lifelike in my opinion, more like a photograph, but I mean, it's obviously still a painting. You can see the blue star on her funnels. Uh, 
meaning that she was a W star line. Now, I'm not sure what these are. I'm wondering if they're lifeboats, but I'm not sure. Because there's really no way you're going to get to them, because it's just portholes here. There, That is a real lifeboat right there. But, um, I know that for certain. But, um, so I hope you guys enjoyed the picture tour and, of course, the video. Um, and I'll see you guys later, and probably my next video is going to be either on the USS William D. Porter, the unluckiest ship in World War II, at, uh, so it was called, or the uh, SS City of Benares, which was the ship that was involved in the Lifeboat 12 incident. Anyway, uh, see you guys. Bye.